So, welcome everyone. This is the Profitables uh, Regeneration pod or uh, podcast and webinar. We are very grateful to have Burke Tigert here as our guest speaker today. Um, I got to know Burke about 20 years ago. It was um, 2023 at a Ranching for Profit school in Colorado Springs, taught by Dave Pratt. And over the last 20 years, um, well, at that point, he stood out to me. I remember he was there with one of his ranch managers from the Rex Ranch in Nebraska. Um, although uh, we've not been in constant communication, I have watched uh, Burke as he's carried out his uh, management abilities with the Deseret Ranches and also with consulting. And you've probably seen some of the things that he's written and um, trade publications. If not, you can check those out. So he's been an advocate for agriculture, for ranching, and he has been able to teach principles of profitable, sustainable, and now the term regenerative ranching um, to farmers and ranchers throughout the United States and definitely had a worldwide impact. So it's a, it's a blessing to have him here with us, and we look forward to hearing from him. Um, for those that are catching the recording, he's going to share some slides so you can look it up on YouTube. Um, the YouTube uh, podcast channel is The Profitable Steward, and uh, you can look at the, you can catch the slides there if you're listening to just the, just the audio side. So Burke, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, sometimes I'll start this off and I'll ask the kind of a random question. Is there something that the common public may not know about you that's just an interesting fact, something that maybe sets you apart or anything that comes to mind along those lines, Burke, that you'd want to share? Well, that's hard to say. There's probably quite a few things about me that the public doesn't know. Um, I don't advertise it a lot, but I guess I'd like to say that I'm a devout Christ Christian, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and uh, that's, uh, I used to say it's a major part of my life. I guess like to, I like, now I like to say it, it is my life, and uh, I fit everything else into that. Uh, but that's that's kind of kind of where I am. I I feel like we need more of that in America to make and keep America great. Yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing that. Um, I agreed, agreed, and uh, I share your share your faith and share your belief. And um, regardless of what your belief or background is, we hope that you can um, you can glean from what Burke shares with us today. So we'll probably go on here till about ten till the hour or until Burke's done, and then we're going to open it up for questions and answers. Um, as always, if you have, if you need clarification, you can type it in the chat box and at the appropriate time, I'll, I'll just interject that. Um, we don't want you to get left behind, but because this is uh, being repurposed as a podcast, um, we'll, we'll just kind of roll with it and then we'll open it up for Q and A at the end. So Burke, let's, uh, let's, let's hear from you. Take it away. Okay. I've given this presentation the title Profitable Ranching. And uh, I recall that when I first went to a ranching for profit school, there were a number of people attending that school and said, ranching for profit, that's an oxymoron. And I'm afraid that to many ranchers in the United States, it is just that. Uh, in the average year, now we've had a run of a couple or three pretty good ones, but in the average year, the average rancher's just, just breaking even. And so those that are not average are slowly going broke and some of them are going broke so slowly that they can keep borrowing more money against their equity because the equity or the uh, the land values keep increasing they they keep operating but ranching can be profitable and it can be profitable year in and year out every single year it can be profitable if you know how to do it and it's in all my years of managing i i had one ranch that lost money one year and I only had it five years, and four of the five years it was profitable, and I think set up to be profitable from then on. Um, they can be profitable. And I think people want to throw their hands in the air and say it's, it's not possible. But it depends a lot on the structure and a number of other things. 
Now, to say if you know how, it's taken me 40, maybe 50 years to really learn what I know and use today. And I'm such an advocate of being a lifelong learner. I, I didn't have to get to this age to be profitable. I was a number of years ago, profitable ranches. But I continue to learn, continue to get better. And frankly, uh, our context gets tougher all the time. It's not as easy to make a profit now as it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and so forth. Um, so that, that keeps catching up with us. We have to keep getting better and better. So uh, what I'm going to present today is, is really uh, a synopsis, if I can say it that way, of, of a two to five hour short course, or excuse me, yeah, workshop that I give. And, the, and then that's part of a three day long short course that I occasionally give. So this is very summary in form. So I hope if you have questions that you'll not hesitate to write them down. And when we get to that point in time, then let's, let's discuss the questions because we're gonna move pretty fast. And we're gonna cover, just go over the top of a lot of things. I think in the ranching business, there's several things we need to understand. First of all, we need to understand what our goals are. And a lot of people really don't have many goals. It's just to continue to operate. But we need to have financial goals. We need to have land and soil health goals. We need to have quality of life goals. I think those are all very important. Uh, some people might ignore the land and soil health, and I want to say that that underpins all the rest of it. If that's not if that's not good, uh, quality of life, financial part probably isn't good either. We need to understand that we have four areas to manage. Understand, I'm borrowing this from the Ranching for Profit folks, there are three ways to improve profit. And then something I summarized and put together 30 years ago, five essentials. The four areas we need to manage are production, economics and finance, marketing, and people. It's really easy for us that are in production agriculture to really overemphasize production. We love it. That's what attracted us to the business in the first place for most of us. Some people had another attraction, but most of us came because we love production. We like to see good grass. We like to see good cattle. We like to have them do well, function well, and we'd like them to be profitable, but we don't emphasize economics and finance very much at times. And marketing, must place an emphasis on marketing and then people. And sometimes people ask me, why people? There's just me and my spouse and two or three kids. I just want to suggest, and we'll talk about it a little more as we go along, but sometimes managing in a family situation is more difficult than managing in a situation where none of the employees or none of the workers are family. To try to commingle a family relationship and a business relationship is not always the easiest thing to do. And so that takes some work. It takes some effort. I might also indicate the people that you need to manage. It's more than managing just people. Over time, you're managing relationships. Your people become self-supervising, so you're managing relationship with them. But then there are a lot of other people with whom you do business. Your banker, the feed salesman the people who keeps your automobiles running, uh, the people maybe from whom you occasionally buy an automobile or a pickup or whatever, the, all the people with whom you do business, either buy from or sell to, hopefully those are bright people that you're picking good people to do business with and they're good, bright people. And sometimes they can offer you suggestions which can be very helpful. So I like to manage those relationships as well. and. Uh, make sure I have good relationships with those people. Occasionally, I'll even invite them to the ranch and show them around, show them what we're doing and say, you guys got any ideas for us? And it's amazing. Sometimes they do. And some of those ideas are good ideas. And like I say, this comes from the Ranching for Profit School. I alter it just a little bit. 
when I say increase turnover, when they say increase turnover, they include in that volume. In other words, rent another ranch, buy another ranch, that increases turnover. Yes, it does. But I like to define turnover of having more units to sell without changing the size of the ranch. Get more turnover on the same size ranch. That really has great economic power. And decrease overheads. You need to understand overheads are either or. You either need them or you don't. If you do need them, you really need them. But if you don't need them, you ought to get rid of them, especially if you're at the break-even level for profitability. Now, if you're highly profitable, you can have some overheads that maybe aren't totally necessary. I'm a grandpa. Um, it's sometimes nice to have a, another side-by-side -side at the ranch. So if grandkids come, I can show them around the ranch. Put them on, put them on that extra side-by-side. -side. Now, they're expensive. If I were on the verge of going broke, I would not have that side by side that I don't need. I would not have six horses when three would do the job. That that kind of thing. Um, now, what are overheads? Overheads are the land and anything attached to the land. Sprinkler systems, fences, corrals, houses, barns tack rooms, calving sheds, anything attached to the land. And people, people are on overhead. People and their tools and equipment to do their job. Now you can see we need overheads, but sometimes we have far too many. And the ranches that I have consulted with and helped with that have been in financial difficulties that have made the fastest improvement to turn things around, have done it by reducing overheads, getting rid of overheads they did not need. And those decisions are made logically much easier than emotionally. It's amazing the attachments we get, and I think I have them too, that we, we're attached to some of our stuff. And when we look at them realistically, sometimes we just have to get rid of some of that stuff that we're attached to. And then we need to improve the gross margin. Those are the three ways. Improve gross margin. What is gross margin? It's total returns. And that's cash returns plus or minus inventory change. Cash returns plus or minus inventory change are your total returns minus the direct costs. And what are the direct costs? In our business, most of the direct costs are feed, vet supplies and services, and marketing. There are a few others, but most of them are, are in those categories. The rest are overheads, and that's why we have to emphasize overheads so much, because overheads are a call either or. Either I need it or I don't, and if I don't need it, I'm better off if I don't have it. And then we want to focus on whole ranch profit. Um, it's profit per acre or whole ranch profit that you strive to improve, not production or even profit per cow. Took me a long time too long to understand this. That's a primrose path you do not want to get led down. And I would bet that if I can include all your peers out there in the group that I'm talking to, which I can't, but if I were to take all ranchers in general, I'd say most of them don't understand that they need to quit emphasizing production or profit per cow and start emphasizing profit per acre or the whole ranch profit. Let me just give a simple example. If I, <clears throat> if I have a thousand, 1,000 pound, or excuse me, 1,000, 1,400 pound cows, I could run on the same land almost, not quite, but almost 1,400 thousand pound cows. And those 1,400 cows weighing 1,000 pounds are going to wean more pounds of calf than 1,000, 1,400 pound cows are. The calf weaning weight will be less for the smaller cows, but it will not be proportionally less. And so you can run about, you can produce about the same amount of pounds of calf from, from one size of cow or another. But I just got looking up today on cattle fax prices last week in Montana and Wyoming, and a 50,000 pound load of calves, 50,000 pound load of calves, if it's loaded with 450 pound calves, 
will bring about $14,000 more than the same load of calves that they're loaded with 650 pound calves. Now that's a pretty big difference. And it's all that deal of looking at production per acre, profit, you know, production per cow rather than, and profit per cow rather than production per acre. So that's something that I'd really like to emphasize is you want to start thinking about profitability. Another thing that I think gets in the way of profitability, and it's one of the things I just talked about, we look so much at profit per cow and we look at weaning weights and we focus on weaning weights. I do not have weaning weights on this list. Weaning weights always come with a cost, always. And sometimes the costs are hidden. We know we had to feed a little more supplement, maybe to get that bigger weaning weight. We had to feed a little better. We also are starting to know, but it took me too long to really think my way all the way through this. It probably took a bigger cow to raise a bigger calf. And it costs more to run that bigger cow. In other words, I have to run fewer of them on the same resource or I've got to buy more feed or rent more ground or whatever. So um, weaning weight comes with the cost. And a lot of times when those cows get bigger, the fertility in those cows diminishes. They don't rebreed as well without extra supplementation. So there's costs that are hidden and costs that are obvious, but weaning weight always comes with the cost. Now, that doesn't mean that sometimes the cost isn't worth it. It sometimes is. But it is not near as powerful a driver as the things that I have listed on this list. Your enterprise mix and choices. You know, you could ask, should I be running cows? Should I have sheep, goats? Or if I have them, maybe should I, if I have cows, maybe should I add sheep? Should I add pastured poultry? Now, these are kind of off the wall kind of su suggestions, but I might also suggest to you that the ranchers I know that are the very most profitable run mixed enterprise operations. I'm just going to leave that one at that, but they do. They run mixed enterprise operations when they're highly profitable. Now, let's just go back to cows, cattle, beef cattle. And if you're running beef cattle and you're starting to make enterprise mixing choices, this might surprise a lot of you, but a terminal operation where you buy all your replacement cows, pregnant replacement cows, buy enough each year to replace the cows you had to cull out and sell every calf every year, that will be more profitable than a maternal operation where you raise your own replacement heifers. And people, when I tell them that, they say, well, I can't raise good enough replacement cows. They don't have to be that good. They just need to be a pregnant cow when you buy them. Cows are cows. Now, they might not have the rebreeding efficiencies if you raised them yourself, but you don't have a blank year in your cash flow. That yearling year is a blank year in your cash flow, and you're carrying that. You're paying the cost of carrying that animal. Now, there is one way that that maternal enterprise can compete with the terminal. If you can sell a lot of bred cows at a premium price, then it's competitive. And the reason for the difference is because you have the blank year, you have the blank year in the, uh, with the yearling heifer where you don't get any income from, but you still got the cost. And then most of us keep that heifer, though she has a lot of value when she's four to six years old, but we keep her till she's as old as she'll get and we sell her for cull cow prices. Now, if you can learn how to take advantage of that appreciation curve and sell that cow at the top of the at the top of the curve or near the top of the curve, a lot of them bred and younger, uh, it brings you a lot more money, and then you're competitive. I know this because I've run the arithmetic hundreds of hundreds of times, literally, for consulting clients, and I've also managed both kinds of ranches. And the only time that my maternal ranches could compete with my terminal ranch, my maternal ranches could compete with my, my terminal ranches is when I could put a good markup in price as I moved that bred cow from the maternal ranch to the terminal ranch. Had to be a good markup, which we did. We could, we could take it out of the income of one, put it into the income of another. 
and do that. And then it was just competitive and that not, a, not a whole lot more. Now, eight years and 10 stocker operations are usually more profitable, profitable than cow-calf operations. Now, stockers that you raise on your own ranch are more profitable than stockers you buy because they have an adaptation to your climate, to your management. And there's epigenetic factors going to work in there too that we could spend a lot more time talking about. So enterprise selection or combinations of enterprise, even in the cattle business, are darned important to your profitability. And uh, sometimes we just get caught up in our preferences. And I'll admit, I'm caught up in mine. I love cows and calves. And I love developing replacement females. But I'm never going to do it again unless I can sell, be selling bred cows or using it as a vehicle to enlarge my own herd. And uh, inventory addition can be highly valuable sometimes. Okay, so that's enterprise mix and choices. Overheads, we've talked about that already. And people are part of the overheads. The ranches I've seen make the biggest changes the quickest in profitability are those that could effectively reduce overheads. I could tell stories about that, but I don't have time. Then stocking rate. Stocking rate's a huge driver of profitability, and it's dependent on a couple of things. You don't want to increase stocking rate and then end up overgrazing. So you've got to get carrying capacity first, which is the supply. Then you can increase stocking rate, which is the demand. Stocking rate can go up if your cow size and milk production isn't so high. Smaller cows giving less milk, you can run more of them. And I might add right here that milk, the conversion of milk or pounds of grass to milk to pounds of calf weaned is a darn poor conversion. You just need enough milk and no more. Good milk, yes, but high, high milk, no. Matter of fact, it's anti-maternal as far as I'm concerned. He's sure anti-profit. Okay, grazing and pasture management. And this is the biggest hitter of all. With good grazing and pasture management, I, I think unless the BLM or the Forest Service gets in your way, which some of you have probably have to contend with, but if you've got deeded land and state lease land, we can double your carrying capacity and do it fairly quickly and fairly simply. In some cases, you have to spend some money to get that done. Uh, probably in every case, but in most cases, not an awful lot. Okay, then fed feed versus grazed feed, a very powerful ratio. If I can feed cows for 30 days or less each year rather than 120 days, the difference in profitability is huge. Some places I don't feed them at all in a year. I'm involved with the ranch in Wyoming. We haven't fed cattle up. We've held the ranch for three, three winters. We haven't fed them a, a bit except for some supplementation, some protein supplementation, but no hay. I mean, they ate a little hay when they're in a corral or something, but they haven't eaten hay. They've grazed. That's in Wyoming, mind you. Fed feed versus graze. Right, so fed feed versus graze feed. If anytime you put a machine between the mouth of the cow and her feed source, it's just cost you money. And we really need to be aware of that. We're competing with people that never feed their cows. And their cows perform and do nicely get high pregnancy rates, high wean calf crop percentages. Okay, calving season. Calving season becomes very important to cutting costs. It's very important to rebreed rates. It's important to manpower requirement and facilities requirement. Lots of things hinge on calving season. Okay, realized herd fertility, when I say realize, it's because I want something to sell off of every pregnancy that occurs. Ideally, you'd get 100% pregnant, 100% of wean a calf, and 100% of them survive till you can sell them. Well, that's never going to happen. But you can see the point I'm trying to make. The closer you can come to that, high conception rate, high, high uh, embryo retention till a calf is born, high very low death loss, so a high survivability rate till you have something to sell. Okay, why is input used for optimum production? If somebody's trying to sell me something, let's say a feed salesman, he wants to tell me that if I feed his feed, I can get X number of pounds of additional growth on my calves. And then he always wants to attach to that the market price. And the market price is never the value of the gain. The value of the gain is usually around a dollar 
Right now it's running a little higher than that, about a dollar thirty or so, but that's rare. More around a dollar, even though we're selling the calves for two dollars and something. The value of the gain is not near the market price. So we've got to remember that. Next of all, hey, I want at least, I want at least figure that I can get two dollars back for every dollar I spend. And people will say, well, gosh, if you get a dollar and ten cents back for every dollar, that ought to be profitable. Yes, it ought to be. But what if I didn't estimate right? What if that salesman didn't estimate right? I want a cushion there until I really, really know what am I going to get for feeding that feed stuff. So I want it to be at least double. And then what if? What if our estimates were right, but things happen and then the price of that feed stuff, that supplement has to go up and our cattle have become addicted. They're used to having it and that's why they're performing the way they're performing. Now I, I can't afford it anymore. I've got to jerk it away. What's going to happen to the performance then? So I, I want at least two for one. Some people say even more than that. They really thought their way through this. So why is input used for optimum production? That's variable inputs. Then marketing. And we just, I used to think I was a pretty good marketer when I was young. Then I started watching other people do interesting things with marketing, and I learned that I wasn't a very good marketer. I'm not sure that I still am. I know I'm not a great salesman. I'm a better marketer than I used to be, but I'm not sure that I'm still as, as good as I could be or would really like to be. Uh, just really important. I think after the two or three at the top, marketing probably has the next, after grazing and pasture management, marketing probably has more power here than anything else if we can learn to do it well. Okay, from all of that, if we can get cows that are adapted to our environment, adapted to our management, which is the part of their environment. Now, I hope you caught that. Our management added to the natural environment is the cow's environment. So we need adapted cows that are adapted to our environment and our management then we need the right calving season. And then we need excellence in grazing management. If we have those three things, they drive a lot of things on soil health, carrying capacity, the ratio of fed feed to grazed feed, the amount of overheads we have to have, labor and facilities, which can come under overheads, and they can have a great effect on herd fertility. So I can't emphasize enough. Adapted cows, calving season, and grazing management. I worked well into my career before I understood any of these as well as I wish I had. And I'm beginning to understand them all. Now, this slide sort of summarizes all that I've just said. And I, I doubt you can fully understand it. It took me years to understand all of this. But it's a summary slide. Reduce overheads. Get excellent herd fertility and market well. Do those three things and then improve three key ratios. Acres per cow, cows per FTE, and FTE for those who may haven't, maybe haven't seen this term, it's full-time equivalent of labor. So a person and a half, person and a quarter, Maybe you're running 200 cows and you say, hey, I can only spend half my time running 200 cows. Cows don't make enough money for me to, to spend all my time there. So I do a day job or I do something else. So that's 0.5 FTE. But cows per FTE is really important economically, has tremendous economic power. And then fed feed versus grace feed. Work on those ratios. If they're always getting better, you're getting better. And you can just count on that. And that's where you want to place your managerial emphasis is to do that. Okay, many years ago, I was invited to give a talk. And I was asked to give a list of 10 things that have helped me the most in, a few, in the last few years in my management of ranches. And I spent a good amount of time making my list of 10. Gave the talks a half a dozen places in the state of Kansas and a kind of a round robin presentation where we moved from place to place twice a day for about three or four days. I don't remember how many days, but. And uh, 
Talks were quite well received, and I was asked to give follow-up talks on them. Well, it didn't take me very long to take that list of 10 and reduce it to these five. And I frankly think, honestly think, that they are the five essentials of how you approach the business of ranch management. How in your uh, mindless time, when it only, don't, don't let it be mindless, when you're riding your horse, just getting from one place to another, you got time to think. When you're driving your pickup, don't listen to the radio, think. And uh, think about these things. And uh, But anyway, they're how you approach the business of management. The approach must be both integrative and holistic. Now, to be integrated, that means we grab bits and pieces of information, knowledge, ideas, et cetera, and we integrate them into one whole, and then we can make holistic-based decisions. Some people call them systems-based decisions. And I don't care which term you use, whether it's systems thinking or holistic thinking, they're close enough to the same that I won't argue which one. But the approach needs to be integrated, put all the pieces together so you can make good holistic decisions considering everything. I, I wish I had time to go through these in detail, but I don't. Um, examples of systems thinking, cattle size and growth rate. Uh, I wanted it and uh, I learned that, oh, if I get it, I'm gonna have bigger cows. Then I gotta run fewer of them. Milking ability, same thing. If I get more of it, cow fertility usually goes down or else I have to feed more supplement. I have to reduce the number of cows because they're getting more milk and milk doesn't come out of the clear blue sky. Cows have to eat more to get more milk. So all those things are coming into play. You got to think of that. Heterosis, do we want maximum heterosis? I love heterosis, but I've had to learn to settle for less than total heterosis. Calving season, what's the best calving season? And I'll tell you, there can be a lot of arguments on that, and we might talk more about it in a few minutes. Wormers and insecticides. Hey, if you use them, you probably get an improvement in production. But if you use them for 10 years, are you still getting the same improvement that you got to begin with? And then if you took them away, then what would happen? I can tell you this. If you're using wormers and insecticides, the pests are developing resistance. And it becomes a race between the chemical makers and the pests. Who's going to win? Who's are they going to are the pests going to get resistant to those pesticides, or are the chemical makers going to come up with a new one? Um, anyway, so there's we got to think holistically here too, or we can make big mistakes. So and then we think about production systems and marketing, and how do we make all that work together? If we calve later, we got to market differently, probably. All kinds of things. So we synchronize all of that and more. We go back to those major determinants of profit, and they all interact with each other if we look at them carefully. So to think holistically, we've got to think of those relationships. So for profitable decision making, become a systems thinker. In other words, be both integrative and holistic. Think, plan, execute, observe, and adjust holistically. I want to suggest to you that probably some of you and most of your peers out there in the, in the cattle business don't know how to do this. They are not system thinkers and they don't know how to approach it in such a way as to become systems thinkers. Ever since we started kindergarten, we started a linear thought process, two plus two equal four and so on. And we've been so ingrained and so entrenched in linear thinking this change in an input results in that change in an output. Might I suggest to you there are no singular effects, none. Every time we make a change in one aspect of management, it has multiple changes in results. And then those cascade forward and they are either positive or negative. We need to learn how to observe and then adjust and do that holistically. It's not easy to do. Some people are more naturally inclined that way than others, but we all need to work at it. We need to become, to the extent we possibly can, good systems thinkers, systems observers, not just looking at one part, look at the whole. Okay, number two, essential number two, strive for continuous improvement of the key resources, land, livestock, and people. I've been saying this now for 30 years, 
It's interesting that I read a magazine article yesterday where the commercial cow man of the year at the Beef Improvement Federation said it exactly the same way I've said it. He's a lot younger than I, so I got to believe he read some of my stuff someplace. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, anyway, he said it almost like I've said it here. Strive for continuous improvement of the key resources, land, livestock, and people. And if you can do that, if you can have them improving, you are going to become more and more profitable, more and more resilient to drought, more able to endure the tough price years, the tough market years. Just a lot of good things happen when you can do that. And then you would much rather own assets that appreciate than assets that depreciate. Land, if you manage it correctly, will appreciate. It will appreciate faster than land owned by your neighbors if they're not doing things to have the land improving and increasing in value. If you're making the livestock more adapted to your management, to your environment, so they're more productive in your environment, then you're getting a leg up on everyone else. You don't own your people, but you own some of their time. You give them a paycheck for it. You pay it for, for, for it every month. And if you can help those people get better, that's a win-win. It's good for them. It's good for you. So constant improvement. And anything that rusts, rots, or depreciates, you want to have as little of that. Now, we got to have some. You probably can't run a ranch without some kind of vehicle or transportation. Uh, even your saddle horse depreciates. So if they rest rots or depreciates, you, you, want to, you want to minimize how much of it you have. Okay. To improve the land and the soil, I am a real believer in adaptive multi-paddock grazing. We won't say much more about that, but it's a form of rotation grazing that's very effective and very important, it will improve land, it'll improve the soil, it'll improve your carrying capacity. As your carrying capacity goes up, then the stocking rate can follow and you can get better animal performance, better fertility, better growth, better health. I'm not gonna say this doesn't happen without a hiccup. Sometimes there is a little hiccup, but overall, that's, that's the tendency, that's what happens. This is a rancher in Southeast Montana. Quite a number of years ago, he thought he, well, he heard of a he heard of a, a lecture that he wanted to go listen to about a guy talking about grazing management. And I think it was Alan Savory that he listened to, and he wasn't sure, but he thought it was too. And anyway, he came back home and he started doing some things. And he said, "I just sort of putted around." And he said, "I didn't make much progress." But then I heard of a field day at the Durham Buffalo Ranch, which is at Wright, Wyoming. But there was a mix of bison producers and and cattle producers at this uh, at this little seminar short course, and he spent three or four days there, and he came home and he started to make some changes and and things started to get better. He just had to start keeping more replacement heifers, keep more replacement heifers, and let the cow herd increase in size. And when I first met him, he had moved from running a cow for thirty acres or cow-calf pair for 30 acres to a cow-calf pair for 16 acres. And he said, the cows are bigger, so I know I've at least doubled my carrying capacity. 30 acres to run a cow, 16 acres to run a cow. Same ranch. That's tremendous economic power. And he said, and while I did that, while I did that, I didn't have to add a tractor. I didn't have to add a an employee. I didn't have to add a pickup. I didn't have to add a saddle horse. Nothing. He said the only thing that changed because we had more cattle is on a cattle working day, branding, shipping, etc. He said we either had to we either had to get more neighbor help, trade our time for other neighbors' help, or hire more day help, or stay longer ourselves. So that was the only thing that changed. It was about five days a year we had to have more manpower, more people power, to get our work done. Okay, this guy, not a leaf on the tree and look at that grass. When he first took over this farm, he calls it a farm in Missouri. He said it took six acres or a little more to run a cow. He says today it takes 1.9 acres to run a cow. That's a cow-calf pair. And I, I thought after I left that ranch the day this picture was taken, and I looked all, all around and nobody had grass like this. I mean, it was like a golf course. 
And I thought, how many people probably drive by Steve's and think, I wonder how much money he spends on fertilizer to get grass like that. And I can tell you this, the only fertilizer that grass gets is the fertilizer that comes out of the back end of those cows. And uh, it's just phenomenal what he's done, what he's been able to do. And, uh, you know, I can't guarantee that other people get exactly the same results, but you start to graze like he grazed and you'll get similar results. Guy in Mississippi, he got tired of buying winter feed and winter supplements. So, and a lot of the winter supplement came from disking, lightly disking warm season grasses because they're south of the fescue belt. So they didn't have any green growing stuff in the fall. They'd lightly disk their warm season grasses and plant rye and then have to fertilize it a lot. He got tired of doing that, started hearing about cover crops and he started no-till seeding, direct seeding into the warm season, standing grasses, standing warm season grasses that were going dormant. So he could still continue to graze those dormant as a fall stock pile for winter feed for his cows while the green was starting to come on. And uh, then it, by the time he'd get into February and March, it starts looking like this. And if you look up close, it's almost good enough to make your own salad out of it. And it's a combination of what he calls grasses, which most of us would call small grains, forbs, and legumes. And he doesn't have to reseed many of the legumes anymore because most of them are self-seeding now. And so minimal seed amounts, and he still gets a very good stand of legumes every year. So just tremendous results. And then this guy in Texas, and he puts 6,000 steers in a mob, up to 6,000 in a mob. And it moves them up to six times a day. Uh, some people suggest to him, hey, isn't that a lot of work? And he says, yeah, it's not near as much work as if we had them scattered in, in uh, 30 or 40 mobs out across the ranch. And I had to check each one of them each day. He said, we can see all these easily in a few minutes. And he said, I, I probably don't get the same production per steer as I used to get. But he said, I get a lot more production per acre just because the number he's able to carry has increased so much. Now he's had to develop water because he has to water all those at one time and he waters them out. He, I don't know, it's a propane long, it's a propane tank, a long, long propane tank that he splits in two right down the middle. So it's it's half of it, not, not half of it standing, but half of it laying. And he says, I just need to have enough water, but that's quite a bit of water that will go clear to the other end of that propane tank. It has to get to the other end of that tank or cattle start getting going crazy, wondering if they're going to have water. But he said, if they can, everyone, when they step up to that tank, if they can get a drink, they're happy campers, and they learn to wait their turn. And that just becomes part of their natural day's event, to wait their turn for water. But he's getting grasses that they had never seen in that part of the country. Warm season grasses that have come back, have returned Eastern Gamma and others. That are, that are there profusely. The soil's getting better. And now he's getting to where he used to say, I think I gave up some yearling gain, but I got more gain per acre. He's now saying, hey, I think I get more, not only more gain per acre, I'm starting to get more gain per individual because the variety in the plants is so great. The bricks reading in the plants is so great that the animals are, are eating better, gaining more. Okay. We talked about continuous improvement of land, continuous improvement of livestock. And that begins with cows selected for this. And people are going to say, my cows, I don't have this. I'm talking in Georgia, and they said, we don't have that. Let me suggest you select cows that fit the toughest time of the year for your cows. The toughest time of year is for your cows. And then you cull these. Cull the opens, the dries, the ones that require individual attention or help. If you have to fix a prolap, if you have to doctor a calf, if you have to assist a birth, they're gone. The wild ones, if they raise a poor calf, and if they're ugly, then be careful with that, but use your definition of ugly. Okay, and then select the right bull. Be really careful. Mature size, moderate or small. Somebody asked me what, you know, how I differentiate between moderate or small, and I said, if you think a 1,400 cow is, pound cow is, uh, is uh is small you better go for or it is small you better go for small not for moderate um 
So most ranches have and want too much milk. Need to, need to reduce the milk in most of our cows. We need to strive for excellent cow fertility. And then when we're selecting bulls, I start saying, okay, do you have to feed that bull in the wintertime to keep him in good condition so he can breed cows next summer? And if you do, do you want his heifers to be your replacement cows? I don't. We get all kinds of articles in the popular press telling us how to take care of bulls so they'll get cows pregnant next summer. If I've got to take care of my bulls that way, I don't want them because I know I'm not going to want these daughters. Shoot, he never has to lactate or gestate. He's got a pretty easy life. And uh, so I'm going to select those kind of bulls. Matter of fact, I'm to the point, and I'll recommend to most big breeders, produce your own bulls. We buy enough either semen or outside bulls just to make sure we have a little counteraction to any inbreeding coefficient that might happen. But when we select them, we can select them from the best cows we have, which are the best cows we can find for our environment and for our management. And then we can just make sure they, they dot the I's and cross the T's that we want at our place. And, uh, and you can sure make rapid progress for fitting your environment. So continuous improvement of people having to go too fast here, but it begins the manager's job, which is to create an environment in which people want to excel and then provide the tools, training, and freedom to do it. That's not easy. Create an environment which people want to excel, then provide tools, training, and freedom, and they're all necessary. Good tools, proper training, freedom. If you're not willing to train, you just well forget being a manager. Good managers are good trainers. And if you're hiring people and you expect them to work at a level that's above the conventional rancher, you can't expect them to know how to do that until you show them, until you train them. Okay, leadership is best gauged by the voluntary response of those being led. You have to gauge it for yourself. It must be voluntary. If it's not voluntary, you have to ask, is it leadership? Probably not. Coercion, pushership, something other than leadership. Best gauged by the voluntary response of those being led. Okay, good planning and decision-making tools. I've got to skip over this one. If you want to see it, you'll read the notes. But they're all important to management. We have to wage war on costs because of competition. If a person can produce a pound of calf or yearling for 10 cents a pound less than we can, they get to stay in business longer. So we must wage war on cost, whether we like that or not. So as you do that, how do you do it? You match cow size calving season to the available resources, and it has an effect on the things on the list on the right-hand side there. Carrying capacity, fed feed versus grazed feed, overheads, grazing management, labor and facilities, and herd fertility. Has an effect on all of those, so we must carefully match cow size and calving season to our resources. So no two ranches are going to be alike in this. And then that will help, help the key profitability things, carrying capacity, fed feed and grazed feed, overheads we can reduce, grazing management we can make it better, reduce labor and facilities and improve herd fertility. Then increase graze days, reduce feeding days. See, I got this, these cows in February, January, February and early March on this kind of feed that you see in the picture here. If I were calving those cows in late February, there's no way I could have them ask me that kind of feed. So the calving season makes a huge, huge difference. I like minimal development of replacement heifers. Just get them through winter, like a dry wintered stalker. The people tell you that a cow has to last five years to become profitable. No, they tell you that because it costs them too much to raise the replacement heifers. If stalkers are more profitable than cows and calves eight years and 10, why isn't the open yearling heifer profitable? On our ranches, the open yearlings were always profitable because we hadn't spent a fortune to get them to that yearling weight. Now, they weren't a great big coming two-year-old, but they still calved nicely, raised a calf, and rebred. You see these calves on here are on a cake line. So they're being, they're being fed about three pounds of a 15% cube. And when situations warranted, snow, extreme cold, they got hay. So 
uh, but wintered a whole lot cheaper than taking them to a feed lot and asking them to be 65% of the expected mature cow weight. They don't have to be that to, re to breed nicely. Okay. So we want good replacement cows and it went from bulls and we want to have cows and bulls that fit our environment and we cut our inputs and after we cut inputs and we cull the right cow. Okay, don't have time to talk about these, but it just reduces all the requirement. Marketing. Got to emphasize marketing, that and production have to go together. And I like to expose heifers for a very short period of time, 24 to 30 days. The opens make good feeders and the pregnants make good cows. You've got them started. They're going to calve on time the first time in their life. Much easier to keep up the rest of their life. Cows, I want a short calving season and a long breeding season. And you say, what, why, how? I'm going to breed them for a long time and I'm going to sell all the late calving cows. And I learned to do that. And somebody's always calving later than I am. And I can sell that cow at a premium price. And once those people get used to those cows and find out they're pretty darn good cows, they just keep coming back and buying them over and over again. Okay, three charts that we put together. And I think it's time for questions. Two. That was great, Bert. Sorry, my internet crashed i'm glad you just carried right on without me um that is really good so we'll open it up here for questions if you have a question for burke just go ahead and unmute um but uh taking taking notes here um that is uh some great principles here burke like you mentioned um principles are eternal they're things that don't change and they're things that are uh they work practices can differ sometimes we get caught up in what the practices are so long breeding season short calving season that makes that makes a ton of sense sell sell the cattle that don't fit your calving season um and i noticed you didn't mention what month you should calve it's more calving in sync calving what works in your environment right what would you say would be the those determining factors that would help someone who is in a high um, sub, substitute feeding situation, meaning they're feeding a lot of hay um, and not grazing, to be able to wean off that hay um, and reduce that in, input cost, calving season being one of them? How would how would you determine like? when your optimal time to calve is i that, that's a very difficult question and i i don't think optimal can be defined for any per, particular ranch but i i think you have to well it can be defined for a particular ranch and you have to define your own but i think things you want to watch out for am i calving too early and i guess my answer to that is basically yes if there's still threat of much winter storm before I start to calf. And I and and am I calving too late? If I'm calving late enough that by the time I'm breeding, the grass is starting to deteriorate markedly and cows are starting to lose a little condition because of the deterioration of the quality of the grass. And that's a pretty tough timeline. I, I've got a friend in in uh, Montana that I actually helped him get started on the ranch he manages now just as I was retiring from Deseret so I didn't get much time to stick around that place but from the number of things I'd seen we decided to to start their calving season on the 20th of April just a couple of years ago I was with him and I asked him if he was still calving at the same time yes do you like the calving season he said you know when I'm calving I worry that we're starting too early but when we're breeding i'm worried that we're starting too late and i said well maybe you're about at the right time if you're worried about the feed quality of breeding and you're worried that there might still be a little chance of blizzard or storm when you're starting but anyway they've made that work nicely i know you can't flirt with going too late now he's in montana with these environments north of i-80 and maybe even north of i-70 that 
if it's not hard to get so especially if you're very far west in the united states it's not hard to get late enough that your fertility rate will just fall out of bed and i i'm sorry but i've experienced that i tried to tried to do some june calving and wish i'd never tried but the, the fertility was the, the herd fertility was pretty sad with cows that calving at other times of the year would would have calved pretty pretty well i'm sure bred and calved well now you got some marketing issues and you have to take those into consideration so picking optimum calving time for your situation your environment is is pretty important very good um so maybe a question on marketing and um i know we kind of went through that pretty fast but um yeah, i'm not sure is i'm not sure if i completely understand the term marketing and i wanted to to get it from your perspective so when i hear marketing i think well i knew bud williams and worked with him and and learned sell by marketing we also direct market um but i can just a traditional cow calf operation that raises calves sells them either weaned or right off the cow what would be the marketing principles that they could employ to uh to that would make a difference in a in that type of an environment where maybe they don't want to direct market they don't want to sell by and they still just want to sell calves at the at the time that works best for them well there's a whole number of things to answer the question i mean everything you mentioned it, it can be and should be considered as part of marketing. It's a, all the transactional stuff and timing stuff to move things from one ownership to another ownership. And it can be directly from you to an end, end of the line consumer, or it can go through a series of middlemen between you and the end of the line consumer. But, uh, and there's all kinds of transactional stuff in there. Uh, I, I like to get people to consider time, form, and place. What's the best? time to sell what i'm going to sell and if you're observant of the markets you should start to get a clue on that what's the best form to sell it in do i sell a calf a weaned calf do i sell a yearling steer or a yearling heifer or if it's a heifer do i sell an open yearling heifer and keep a bred yearling heifer um do i sell a bred cow or do i just sell them when they come open or what do I do with my cows that just don't work anymore? Bad udders, lameness, et cetera, but they're still alive, but they're not doing me any good. So you've got time, form, and then place. And where's the best place? And place is getting to be kind of nebulous because of online auctions. So place might be your place, but it's really somebody else's place is facilitating that. So we have to think a little more broadly about that. But if we'll think in terms of time, form, and place, what's the best form? to sell what we raise on our ranch. Now we gotta be thinking holistically though, are we calving at the right time? And if we calve at the right time, that's gonna change the form. Then when we have that form, what, what's the best one to sell? I know people that are calving later and leaving calves on the cows up to 10 or 11 months. And they say they have to supplement the cow more protein in the winter time when she's grazing to get her through winter. But that added supplementation cost, calf eating some of it, cow eating some of it, eating more because giving a little milk, that's still cheaper than putting the calf in a lot to get the calf all the way through winter. So there's all kinds of things we start thinking holistically, thinking from a systems viewpoint that we've got to consider here. But So we change the calving season, the form changes. How much do we change the form? So maybe not a calf anymore, maybe a short yearling or a long yearling. We might have a calf to wean just about the time they're going on the grass and they're going to be as green as a gourd. The gaff de ga graf grass demand might be super for those calves about that time. So all, all kinds of options to consider and you just have to be aware of as much of that as you possibly can be. And I think um, building in flexibility so that from year to year you can, um, you can adapt as well. Um, yeah. So maybe on some years you've got extra grass, those calves, you you take advantage of that compensatory gain. Other years when you're short on grass, let somebody else take the risk and uh, 
market them. Lindsay asked a good question. Um, where do you find those small frame cows, the 1,000 to 1,100 pound cow when everything is, this is a lot bigger that's out there. And Do you have any suggestions on that, Burke? Well, a lot of people say just sell yours and go buy them. I don't believe in that. I think everybody has some pretty good cows. They might be too big for their environment, but if they're getting pregnant every year, the way you're managing, I'd say just buy smaller bulls. And there are some people out there that have those. Buy smaller bulls. If you think the cow size needs to come down, and if you look at your cows and the smaller ones tend to get pregnant a little better, raise a little more calf in relationship to their size all the time. You know, just, and then, but breed for a short period of time. Not cows, but sell the later calving ones. I got to where I could sell every cow that hadn't calved in the first 30 days. That's pretty fun. And could sell them as bred cows. But the heifers, we just started breeding at 30 days, and then we finally shortened it to 24 days. And at first, the conception rates weren't that great. But the ones that stayed were were fertile, and they tended to be a little smaller in size. I think they fit our feedstuffs, our environment a little better. And, uh, you know, and, and just cull the right cows. Cull the ones that aren't doing it. But if if that indicates to you that your cows need to be smaller for where you are, then then buy smaller bulls or I'm saying raise your own bulls out of the best cows. If you've always culled the opens and the dries, which I'm afraid most people haven't done, but if you have always culled the opens and the dries, if you've got some eight, nine, 10 year old cows, they're pretty dang good cows. And in the cull market, they're not going to do very good. What's wrong with letting those cows raise some bulls for you? Those cows are fitting your environment. I don't know how they'll be size wise, but whatever comes from those is is working in, at your place. So let it be what it'll be. If you if you select for adapted cows that adapt pretty soon, it'll tell you what size they ought to be. But I'm convinced that most people, when they buy bulls, are bringing back to their herd the very problems that they're trying to cull against, trying to cull and get rid of. Because we don't select seed stock breeders with enough care, and then we don't select amongst those bulls with enough care. You know, there's a seed stock breeder really trying to, to make bulls that will make us more profitable, the right kind. So I, I, that, that's kind of my approach. You just have to work for adaptation. And I think you have to work at it from both sides of the pedigree. And I don't care if they get a little bigger. It's going to be easier to sell the calves if they are a little bigger. I mean, I'd love to run 900-pound cows, but I don't think I can sell their calves because the feedlot's going to want a little bit bigger calf unless I can figure out a way to direct market those calves. Now, then, if I, if I can do that, great. But if I can't direct market them, chances are I can't sell the calves out of those cows because the feeder's not going to want to buy them. A calf that's that small, I'm going to have a carcass that's going to be that light. So. Uh, I I love small cows, but we've got to be realistic in how small. And again, more than anything, I want a cow that gets pregnant and never gets sick. And if she can get pregnant every year and not get sick, I never have to touch her. To me, that's criteria number one. And if the calf just needs to be acceptable, I don't want to raise a dink, but if it's a good acceptable calf, those things will make me money every year. Good. Yeah, great, great answer. Thank you for that. Another question that came in, um, and I think you've kind of touched on this, but um, in an environment with a short growing season, like here in the uh, Great Basin, Intermountain West, you know, where we grow most of our grass in a six weeks, win six, six week window, um, is it better to calve on green grass or breed on green grass? That is a very hard question, one I've been trying to answer. <laughs> uh, you know, I think almost everything west of um, I-25 and, and probably halfway between I-25 and I-35, if you know where that is, I-35 is, it goes basically from Oklahoma City north through uh, um, York, Nebraska, if you know where that is, the eastern side of Nebraska anyway, and goes on north to, to Canada. But almost any, halfway between there and the rest of the Western United States, we grow most of our feed in 
in 60 days or less in the typical year. Well, there'll be a year once in a while. Sometimes we'll get in some places, we'll be blessed with a little bit August rain, early September rain and get a little green up, but not a lot of feed grows. And then we have to get good at rationing that through the rest of the year. That's, that's just a reality. However, our quality probably persists better in the West than it does further East to get cows to rebreed. Um, so I'm not really concerned about being way, or, you know, a little bit late. I am concerned about being too late. And I, I think everybody just has to kind of feel it out. If I'm going to make changes, I'm probably not going to make them real fast. Dick Divin recommended this stuff years ago to, to, to Stan Parsons. And they're the ones that started talking about this. Calving in sync with nature and in sync with nature is watch when the deer and the elk have their young in your area, maybe even the antelope. The deer and the elk, uh, the catch-all name is cervidae. But I think the cervidae are not as close to the reproduction in tract or timing as they are as as bovines are to the bison and so because i got thinking about that i asked uh mark costler who who's kind of the operations guy he runs the operations for ted turner been associated with bison for years and i said when did the bison calve if you're not supplementing them or feeding them or something else to maybe make them just naturally change you just let the bulls in all the time and they calve and he said they will tend to calve predominantly someplace between two and four weeks earlier than the cervidae here in elk. And so that got me thinking. He says the only difference, he says, that you need to be a little concerned about is, and as you get further north, it becomes more important, is that bison calf is built to take a more severe storm than a bovine calf because of the way the hair on the head and the body is. But, you know, I've learned if a cow is smart and you've got any protection for it at all, to hide in some trees or whatever else, she can calve in a pretty bad situation. She'll get that calf up and that calf nurses twice. It's pretty dang tough. I still don't want a born in blizzards if I can help it. But I guess I'm to the point I'm saying, I, I think if I can cow, calve a cow on the edge of green, she doesn't need to have had green before. That means I'm probably going to be breeding her on the other edge of green. And it's going to be deteriorating. But I found that doing that, well, I'll tell you what, that April 20th thing seems to work pretty good. Once in a while, you fight some weather, but doggone, they will breed. And that's with just minimal protein supplementation in the wintertime. In the areas I'm talking about, they they just they get pregnant in, in the 90s and, and oftentimes high in the 90s. So I, I, you know, each has to pick his own. Yeah. If I were moving very far later than about the 20th of April, I would make those moves pretty darn slow. Because I know a guy that went from April 1 to May 1, and he did it in one, one change. And boy, he lost a lot of fertility real quick. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen that. We've seen that firsthand as well. Um, and so coming out of this tough winter. When yeah. I think the I think the cows can adapt. I think there's epigenetic factors. I don't know if you know what epigenetics are, but epigenetics are the effect that environment, and that can be prenatal environment, postnatal environment, whatever's around them, that it has effect on gene expression. And so I I think as you change those dates, if you do it a little more slowly, the epigenetics can work in your favor. And uh and help that cow get pregnant at a little later date. But if you make it too abruptly, you interrupt that. The, the, the epigenetics can't change it enough fast enough. Yeah, that's great observation. Um, well, just uh, maybe the last point of discussion here before we um, end the recording. I know individuals that have uh, worked under your leadership and one of the things that they mentioned is that um, you, if I understand it right, you would kind of turn a cow herd over to them. They would steward that herd. They would steward that unit or that portion of the ranch. Um, they had the autonomy to make certain decisions uh, for that, even within parameters. So um, 
are there, I know you've touched on it and this is probably a whole day seminar, but what are, what are some key things that we as ranch owners need to do to step into the leadership role more and step away more from using the, the uh, ranching for profit terms, the Whitby or working in the business? Um, what, what comes to mind for you and what helped you in your tenure as a leader in the industry? Let me tackle that backward just a little bit. I'm a real believer in what be W O T B working on the business and differentiating that from Whitby working in the business. However, having said that, I think the natural tendency toward laziness in all of us would have us all desire to spend a lot more time in what be and less time in Whitby. And we only need so much time in what be. And most of our ranches are small enough that we have no choice but to spend quite a bit of time in Whitby. The worker and manager in most of the operations in America are wearing the same hat. It, they just got to know when to take one hat off. Well, they're wearing two hats. It's, they got to know when to put one hat on and, and put the other one on. So I, I think a morning a week or an afternoon a week, depending on how important the mornings are for you to be outside and you want to be there when the weather's cooler and whatever, but I'm smarter in the morning. So I like to do my walk be in the morning, but anyway, it, you'd have to allocate that time properly, but we have so much time when we're wandering around on our horse, on our four wheeler, on our, in our pickup, that just getting from place to place that if we will use that time to supplement our what be, we can use that very, very effectively. Uh, my driving times ends up being some of my most creative times and my very best times. So I would just say that. Now, in times of in terms of helping people, and I did, I go to the other end of that. I on on our ranches, I wanted every full time employee to have a herd. If I couldn't give that person a herd, I probably didn't need a full timer, a part timer maybe, to do whatever I, you know, be a mechanic or a fencer or whatever else. But my full-time people, they were building electric fence that we were moving fairly frequently. If it was temporary or even permanent electric fence, they maintained their own fences, moved their own cattle. And on our grazing, we were moving fairly frequently. And they they tended herds of 800 mama cows, cows and calves, and then maybe a herd of 500 heady yearlings in addition. And I, I don't think physically any of them were ever overworked. Um, Matter of fact, and I'm being a little snide here, which I shouldn't be because I had great people and they all did a wonderful job. But I, I think there were times when they they had plenty of time to just kind of do what they wanted to do. Um, they're uh, in the busy seasons, they were busy without a question. But, um, you know, one man can handle 800 cows in one herd far easier than he can ha handle 800 cows in eight herds. That's one of the things grazing management does. You can put your cattle together and put them in big mobs. And the manpower requirement just diminishes tremendously. But I like to do things like that. And then I, you know, the manager's job, create an environment in which people want to excel. And if you get that done and you have those kind of people and they want to get better and they can see that they're getting better is going to be rewarded, then, you know, then provide tools, training, and freedom. And as they get, yeah, you make sure they get the proper tools. As you give them training and you can see they're doing what they need to be doing, then you give freedom. And as you give freedom, they become self-supervising. Your amount of time you have to spend with them diminishes significantly to the point it becomes very little time. You know, you have staff meetings now and again to coordinate, make sure you're staying on the same page. You share data from one herd to the other. Which one? Which one got the best weaning weight, the best preg rates, uh, you know, the, the best uh, weaned calf crop percentage, the lowest death losses, and how much feed supplement did they have to buy to get that done and share those kind of records between you. It's amazing how much people learn from each other and how soon they, they get good. And it makes leadership just a ton easier. I don't think any of us are real great bosses. Uh, to be good in our business, it takes a certain amount of, can I say, impatience because we've got to do things on time. Cows only give us one chance every year to do everything. And uh, impatient people don't make the, the greatest bosses. 
you know, I think I learned to, I think I learned to bite my tongue and and not, I don't think I ever rained on anybody. Um, I, I sure tried not to, and I don't think that's a good way to manage, but leadership is the development of, of people who can be self-supervising. And if you can get people to where they're self-supervising, it is so much easier. And they become so much a valuable part of your team. They bring ideas. Most of my good ideas came from our team of people. You know, I, I'm not sure I'm an original idea person. I've just synthesized a lot of ideas that I've borrowed from other people. And, uh, you know, and I think most of you will do that. If you have successful careers, most of your ideas are going to come from elsewhere. And I've maybe combined ideas differently than some people. And, uh, and you know, other good managers are going to do the same thing, I think. Well, that's great. And, and I think that's the quality of a leader is that they, they don't have to be the originator of the idea, right? They can, they can be humble enough that the idea could come from the lowliest of people on the staff. And, and if it's a good idea, it's a good idea and you're willing to implement it. So yeah. Well, and, give, and give credit for that. You want those ideas to keep coming. Right. Yeah. Don't shut them down. Right. And I mean, there, there are times that I'd have Somebody, maybe a student intern in the exit interview, ask them what they thought of what, what can we do better? And they'll come up with a, an idea and you just hit yourself beside the head and say, gee, dummy, why didn't you think of that? Uh, yeah. you know, when they mention it, obvious is obvious. And here I've been at it for years and years and years. And why hadn't I thought of that idea? Perfect. No, position on the org chart or even IQ level has no corner on good ideas. They can come from any place. Do not shoot down the dumb idea. And there will be some that will be dumb, but do not shoot it down. Treat it with respect because you want the ideas to continue to come. Very good. Well, this has been a great conversation. I wish we could carry on for another day, but we probably better cut it off here. Um, Burke, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you if they want to learn more about what you do? Um, whether... Uh, whether that's a one-on-one -on -one consultation, if it's the right fit, or just to learn more um, or access some of your writings, things like that. Is there, a good, is there a good way to do that? I don't know. I think the I think B still has the old blog, the, the old link that the link my people can email me and I can send them that link if they can't find it on Beef Magazine. But it has a whole series of articles I did for yay many years. Yeah, I write, I write occasionally now for Canadian cattlemen, and I think you can Google them and get, get what I've been doing there more recently. Perfect. And then, you know, I'm just in various of these kinds of things, these podcasts around the country, various people have me doing understanding ag. I work with them and they, they've they had me on, the, Clay Connery's had me on a couple. And so there's, there's, there's that kind of stuff out there too. But um, if people want to call, I think I think on the very first slide, I think it gave my, I th and I can maybe flip back there. I think I gave my phone number and email address. And they yeah. can certainly, certainly reach out to the Ag Steward team if they need that. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll put that up one last time. And uh, for those that are on the recording, I'll just I'll just say it over the recording. Um, 435-881-2757, 435-881-2757, and uh, Burke, B-U-R-K-E, T-E-I at Comcast.net is a good email. Well, right. Burke, and then things I do, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do individual consultations, I'll do, um, I'll do, uh, uh, short courses or workshops uh, for about any length of time that you want. Uh, I think really to be valuable, you need at least a three hour workshop and a short course. We've done those up to three days. Perfect. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, from the Ag Steward team, we, if, if this is your first exposure to what we do, we do these webinars twice a month. Our mission here at Ag Steward is to help family farms and ranches become highly profitable, independent of subsidies, whether that's uh, subsidized labor or government subsidies. So become highly profitable, regenerate the land that you steward. 
and pass on viable businesses to the next generation. And that's really what we focus on. And so these caliber of speakers are the ones that we want to put you in touch with, because I certainly don't have all the answers or all the expertise. Um, that being said, uh, we love to work with people one-on-one. -on -one. We love to work with businesses, whether you're a startup business, um, you've got a dream and a big idea, and you want to get started in the ag industry, specifically um, from a regenerative agriculture, farming or ranching standpoint, or on the other end of the spectrum, some of our clients are transitioning or then, and they're in that phase where they're, uh, they're moving towards retirement and they're bringing in the next generation. And those are some fun opportunities also as we look at that and how we can help them and help that succession planning um, so that, so that, that uh, the ranch can continue to be viable for generations to come. So reach out to the Ag Steward team. The best way is just jared at agsteward.fyi. Um, if you're part of this, if you're watching the, uh, the live webinar, you've got, you've got access to these. If you want to be sure and get email updates, um, it's agsteward.fyi forward slash webinar. And then that'll put you in contact with the, with the upcoming ones. So we do these twice a month, Thursdays, second and fourth Thursdays at four Pacific. Very good. We'll go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks, everybody, for joining.